And uh, thank all of you for coming today. Uh, really great to be able to have you here uh, in Monday Poets, where we feature uh, some of the premier like local and, and abroad poets uh, that, that we have uh, right here through the Philadelphia Free Library. Super, super uh, excited to bring you two poets uh, who's really rooted in, uh, in, in more naturalistic uh, feeling poems, uh, Amy Barone and uh, Maria Fama. Um, both uh, have recent book, books that have put out that they put out. Uh, the links for those books are going to be available, and then hopefully they'll be able to read some of them. We're going to start off with Amy Barone, whose uh, most recent book, Defying Extinction, you can get for yourself uh, in your homes, and uh, the links for that are going to be posted very soon. Looking forward to hearing some of some of your work, Amy, for sure. Uh, and just to start things off. Amy Barone's new collection, Defying Extinction, was published by Broadstone Books in 2022. Uh, new York Quarterly Books released her collection, We Became Summer, in 2018. She wrote chat books, uh, the chat books Kamikaze Dance, Finishing Line Press, and Views from the Driveway, Foothills Publishing. Barone's poetry has appeared in Local Knowledge, uh, Martello Journal in Ireland, Muddy River Poetry Review, Newverse News, and Patterson Literary Review, among other publications. She belongs to the Poetry Society of America and uh, in Brevis Online Poetry Community. You can, uh, you, you can pronounce that correctly for me, Amy, once you get off mute. Uh, from Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania, not too far, and now lives in New York City. Uh, please put up your, your emoji hands, shake your hands uh, if you can, or just put them together for Amy Barone. Thank you, Warren. Um, a big thank you to the Free Library of Philadelphia for its contributions to the poetry world. Juanita Vega D. Joseph from the Art, Art and Literature Department, Natasha Smith, who's handling tech, and of course, our host, Warren Longmire. Thank you to all my friends and poetry lovers who came out tonight. I see my publisher, Larry Moore, is with us. Thank you, Larry. He's uh, based in Kentucky. I'm honored to be reading with talented friend, poet and storyteller, Maria Fama. And um, I will be reading from my new book, Defying Extinction. And there is a link to the book in the chat room. I'm gonna start with two poems from the section, Sacred Places, Sanctum. Some places need no name, like the local bird sanctuary, a two acre park bequeathed to Haverford by an eccentric neighbor, or an emerald carpet studded with hundreds of trees and blueberry bushes is rolled out for heart rarey visitors, like an ethereal shrine. Entranced. Swathed in bright white clothing, descendants of the America's first slaves fervently pray to their Orishas until they fall into a trance. A woman approaches the moored boat as I anxiously watch from the tour bus. Hondable comes alive in their Yoruba tongue. Many Catholics embrace it. In Bahia, Brazil's land of happiness, Salvadorans mix religion with black magic and revelry, where the Atlantic is wilder, the stars more intense. And uh, my next poem is actually an ekphrastic poem. And um, it came about, there was a collaboration among poets and artists from a craft guild in Chester County, Pennsylvania. And uh, it was based on a quilt that an artist um, created. It's called Twilight Flight. After the sun drops, a cobalt dusk takes root. Leaves in ochre, saffron, and jade float toward night. Vestiges from the maidenhair tree, symbol of love and longevity, venerated as sacred and strong. Distant cousins survived Hiroshima. Traces of emerald horizon and brown shadow give way to blue tattooed sky. Fan-shaped bodies of foliage, their delicate veins like scenes of a quilt, 
find safety in numbers, reach for partners as they sway and prance. Emboldened by a twilight dance, they grow larger beneath chameleon leaves, heavens bringing breezes and calm, celebrating day's end, beckoning us to dream in color and touch, find peace. The canary. The yellow cardinal was spotted yesterday in Alabaster, Alabama. The news flew across Facebook and Twitter. The rare hued bird garnered fast fame. Yet skin tone renders some creatures hidden, others invisible, whether they want to be seen and heard or not. Tree ghost. Riveted to trees, snow, and sky, he rocks a maxi cape of golden brown feathers, flaunts a fresh manicure. A creature without a strong star, but I thought that mattered little. His silent amber eyes compensate. Speaking through off-balance ears, the hoot of a wise man with killer instinct ventures out at dusk. He shuns sleep, spurns the legions, prefers anonymity when hunting. Mistaken for a ghost, this beast alarms visitors to cemeteries where a magical wind always blows and prey thrives. The face of many I left behind. And uh, Queen of Tone. Abigail Ibarra didn't live nine lives. She stopped at one. Her job spanned over 50 years at Fender Guitars, where small nimble hands of a Latino teen made waves. A pickup winder, she advanced from work and soldering and lit a path for other young women who found joy in a unique job. Striving for brilliance, her electric guitars mesmerized legions of fans and radicalized the sound of rock music. She drew demand from Jimi Hendrix, Joan Jett, Eric Clapton, who relied on her handcrafted pickups for their edgy sound. A legacy with measure, they say she wound guitar wire that would have circled the world 16 times. Lessons. He invites me to his villa in Tivoli, presses me to love fluidly. If not, how do you know? We both love horses, storytelling, the eternal city. We abhor wicked lovers and fickle friends. Right of love, not war. Right of the heart's traitors, not politicians. Despite a gap of over 2000 years, Ages after the rise and fall of Rome, Catullus gives me writing lessons. And um, I'm gonna read a few poems from the section, Love and Family, gripped by the edge of night. I learned the facts of life at the foot of my mother's ironing board each afternoon as we followed the edge of night. Sex was more mysterious in the 1960s but I understood its essence. The show's dapper Adam Drake awakened my crush penchant. Transfixed by handsome actors that filled the black and white screen, watching soap operas made me want to grow up fast and get married. So I practiced during kindergarten until my mother received a call from a teacher saying that I was spending too much time in the playoffs. The soaps talk how to cope with stress. Head to the crystal decanter and pour yourself a stiff one. If you need to take more of the edge off, light up a cigarette. The edge of night had a 30 year run. I can still picture Monticello's indigo cityscape on the screen and hear the dramatic themes with its strong piano. Beauty parlor. At Peg and Sue's beauty salon, we sat listening to the radio for the numbers. My mother under the hairdryer, 
her salt and pepper curls in big pink rollers. Me on the floor, paging through fashion and women's magazines, dreaming of glamour and straight blonde hair. Here housewives gathered for their weekly wash and set, amid the scent of permanent wave solution. Manicures were a treat for special occasions. All worried for Jude Plum, who was eligible for the draft. The Vietnam War raged on. So many now gone. Today, Jude runs a chic hair salon in a more upscale section of Bryn Mawr, catering to cancer patients and survivors. And um, from the section, heirlooms, sacred rock. Pouty mouthed figures with ribbony arms and majestic and languid poses fill the rooms of Pace Gallery. Many recall the sharply chiseled face of Abraham Lincoln. Some wink, others hide eyes. The aristocrat, Haiti said, and cave girl. Hollowed and precious white rock from Carrara, where anarchy boomed in the 1800s and ex-convicts and fugitives worked the mines. Dangerous work still, but marble thrives. Retracing Michelangelo's steps, an Irish artist travels to Pietra Santa at the foot of Tuscany's Apple and Ops. He builds trust with families whose artisan studios eschew machines. Kevin Francis Gray from a price resource that glitters in raw form, fashions his version of David. And um, charm bracelet. A tiny ruby chip marks the date of our wedding on a 14 karat gold calendar for July 57. Three facial silhouettes etched with their girls' names and birth dates. A Christmas tree decorated with red, pink, and blue jeweled balls. San Francisco's Golden Gate Bridge, her monogram on the back. She was never one to waste space. A big round smoky topaz in a stunning gold setting fit for a queen. A scene of Athens Parthenon, a place she'd never visit, visited, but I dreamed of seeing. The number of her first homeroom, HRS 30 at Chester High School. A tiny gold music box that plays, I'll see you in my dreams. Back to Love and Family. This is called Secret Flight. It has an epigraph. The word travel is linked to travail, meaning work in French. A tripalium is a three-staked instrument of torture used in ancient Rome. The dark family secret sailed on a long, slow journey. It started back when travel lured, invigorated, kept me absorbed in a place. A diminished world spinning faster and faster made a dent, but the secret stayed dormant. A tale of infidelity, indiscretion, lust that I should have kept buried, but instead confided when trust and longing triumphed. It came to rest on my mother's ears as she lay dying. I could see the shock in her eyes in silence. The secret revealed in a whisper by my sister, who once caroused with me in Sedona, Acapulco, Rome, before the stress of delays, long lines, missed connections. And, uh, some of you may be familiar with this retail operation in Philadelphia area, the head nut. Aromas of French roast and saline cinnamon intoxicate. Barrels of nuts and spice fill this store where I unearth hard to find ingredients, cash or checks preferred. I'm lured by a pile of Easter candy whose sugary thin wafer when I was a kid reminded me of communion hosts. Strips of red licorice transport me to my father's den 
where he kept a stash of sweets in a drawer. As traditional retailers fold, replaced by virtual stores, I make tracks to the head nut for kitchen staples, service with a smile and welcoming chit chat, dried papaya in summer, fall, Italian chestnuts in fall, bargain weekly specials, a coffee bar serves as rest stop. Civilization, as I like it, slowly vanishing in American towns. And, um, my second to last poem is the title poem. Again, I thank you to everyone who came out to celebrate poetry tonight. I see a lot of familiar names who registered. Um, Defying extinction. The ribbon will be massive, proof that no lady died in vain. I add a piece of sky blue fabric from bedding my late mother sent me as a housewarming gift. Others brought cherished family linens, baby clothes, and delicate doilies. A writer weaved in a purple silk blouse to create a memorial that will hang along the brown building in lower Manhattan, where 146 garment workers at the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory perished in a fire on March 25th, 1911, one of the nation's worst work disasters. We honor mothers, wives, sisters, daughters, and friends, plus 17 men who worked with their hands, mostly immigrants in a new land, escape blocked by locked exits and stairwells. Their sacrifice propelled activism, dignity for workers, remembering. And um, I'm, going to, I'm going to end with Heavenly Park. At day's end, when the sun's myriad campfires recede, light a torch with the fire Prometheus seized and join me at a dark sky park. Earth's hot, a nightfall is safer. Maybe we'll find remnants of a shiny meteorite to hang at home. I'll fix a moonrise picnic on a beach of stardust with a view of Andromeda and the Milky Way while we can, before the stars explode. Cosmic beauty may pretend the end, the big crunch or big rip or quantum bubble. Dark energy isn't loyal. It may catch us unawares between bites of barbecue tofu or between breaths as we gaze at the North Star. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amy, for those uh, lush and very personal uh, poems as well. We're looking forward to, to digging into those a little Thank bit with you. you. Um, sure. Um, and we will be, after uh, after our second reading, having a little question and answer. I definitely have some, some questions uh, for, for the poets. Um, but if you have questions, you can feel free to drop those into chat and uh, I'll make sure that they go exactly where they're supposed to go. All right. So with that, I want to welcome to uh, to the proverbial mic, uh, Maria Fama, our second reader of the night. Uh, Maria Fama is the author of seven books of poetry. Uh, her work appears in numerous publications and has been anthologized. In 2018, she was awarded second prize in the 2018 Allen Ginsberg uh, Poetry Awards. Her latest book of poems, other Nations, an Animal Journal was published by Pearl Song Press in 2017, and Mystics in the Family was published in 2013 by uh, Bordigera Press. Uh, Maria Fama lives and works in Philadelphia and is available to do readings and workshop. Please uh, put your hands together for Fama. Thank you very much, Warren. I just want to do one correction. My latest book is The Good for the Good that came out in 2019. So I don't know if you caught that or not. Anyway, it's a big honor to be part of the Monday Night Poets. Years ago, I was a host for Monday Night Poets. So you can know how long ago that was. And I'm very honored to be reading with dear friend and talented poet, Amy Barone, who did a beautiful reading just now. Thank you, Natasha. 
Juanita, and Warren for all your hard work. Now, I want to start, we're not that far away from the holidays, just a couple months ago. So I want to read you this poem, Drawing Stars. My mother taught me to draw stars one afternoon in the bright kitchen, window panes frosted over, December holiday time. My mother is starting a marinara sauce, peeling the garlic, chopping the onion. I sit at the kitchen table with pencil, paper, crayons, scissors, glitter, glue, not quite five, excited, intense, intent on drawing stars. I squeeze the pencil tight. It races around, trails, stops, droopy, crazy lines, no stars. I plead with my mother to show me how. She carefully places the pencil between my fingers, puts her hand sweetly fragrant with garlic and onion over mine as she guides me up and down, over and across, up and down again, teaching me to draw stars. Together, we draw five-point Christmas stars, six-point stars of David. We stop and admire them. I open my crayon pouch of pink paisley fabric my mother has made for me. I love that it opens and closes with a green ribbon drawstring. Inside are all my crayons, new and old, all the best colors for all the beautiful stars I will make. I slowly draw stars on my own, five-point Christmas stars, six-point stars of David. I color them, paste glitter on, cut them out. Later, we hang them on the indoor orange tree from Sicily, where at the top, an angel sits. A half century later, the boss loses her patience with me. She must let me go. She cannot teach me to go as fast as she wants on all the tasks I try to do. Intense, intent on doing the job, I wanted to learn how to speed through the job. Yet all my best lessons learned so long ago have been of slowness, patience, striving for beauty. Just as when my mother and I sat at the kitchen table drawing stars. Uh, two months ago, my brother Pete passed away of cardiac arrest. And uh, I have three younger brothers. I'm the oldest. And I'd like to read this poem as a tribute to my brother, Pete, because I'll always be the big sister and he a younger brother. This is from my book, um, Other Nations, an animal journal, which was a book all about animals and our relationship with animals. And this is called How to Talk, where my brother Pete is featured as a baby. Play this record every day, three times a day. The teacher parakeet to talk booklet said, the summer I was nine. If you follow these directions carefully, your parakeet will talk within a month. Chico could whistle tunes, sit on my finger, kiss my nose, climb toy ladders, but I wanted him to talk. Every day in the steamy July kitchen from 10 to 11, two to three, four to five, I played the record amid chirps and squawks, real parakeets said words after a lady said them first. Sweetheart, sweetheart, I love you, I love you. Hello, baby, wanna kiss? Every day my baby brother crawled in diapers to sit by the record player. Chico cocked his green head, black eyes attentive. As I spun the disc for weeks, my baby brother repeated after the lady and repeated after the birds. Hello, baby, want a kiss? Need a cracker now. I love you, sweetheart. Chico whistled his appreciation when the record lady spoke, when the record birds spoke, when my brother spoke, Chico never learned to talk. I did not ask for my money back. The record did teach a baby to talk within a month.
I've been an educator most of my adult life. I've been a teacher, professor, tutor. And this poem came about when I was teaching when I was tutoring a first grader and she gave me a wonderful idea for a poem. It's called Failing Time and Money for Gabriella. When I tutored you, Gabriella, I had the little clock faces ready and pennies, nickels, dimes, quarters for our review of first grade lessons. When you saw the clocks, you told me I failed time. Eyeing the stacks of coins, you told me, I failed money too. I did not tell you then that I've also failed time. With my watch strapped to my wrist, I cannot squeeze into the passing hours all that I want to do. I failed money too, always broke my hard earned money never enough as I wonder how to pay my bills. Yet I think, dear child, the time failed us when people long ago made up such things as seconds, minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, years, centuries, millennia. If we divide the vastness of eternity in a different way, you, sweet child of seven, might be a few minutes old. I might be nine instead of 69. The more we count, the more time fails us. Money, oh money, Gabriella, these raggedy, greenbacks, these tiny dimes, heavy nickels, plain old pennies, evolving quarters are even phonier than time. Time at least has the pacing of the sun and moon. Money has only those in charge to tell us to agree that money is worth what they tell us. So we can trade it in for what we need and what we don't need. Money must fail us all. There's always a price tag we cannot afford. Since time is money in our society, I must teach you, dear child, these clock faces and these coins. I must also tell you, Gabriella, we are both rich in spirit and nature. We have eternity on our side. Let us both fail money and time. And now uh, I would like to read some brand new poetry. I've not read them aloud to anyone. I've never read them at readings. They're really brand new. So you're my guinea pigs tonight. Thank you all for participating in this reading. So um, the first one is called Seven Up Summers. And um, our sports teams in Philadelphia have really uh, been giving us thrills. We had the World Series, the Phillies, participated in the World Series. And we just won the champion, the football team, the Eagles just won the championship and we'll be in the Super Bowl. So this is how I learned about baseball. And this is called Seven Up Summers. The taste of Seven Up reminds me of summers at my grandparents' house, where cases of Seven Up and Schmidt's beer were delivered every month during long, hot, school-free summers. When my grandfather Pete taught us kids all about baseball and my grandmother Minnie taught us how to sit and pray through thunderstorms. Philly's games were televised during the day. Grandpa got us each a small bottle of 7-Up, himself a beer, turned on the game, sat in his big chair while we sat close by, hanging on to his every word as he explained a simple and complex points of baseball. Always patient, he answered all our questions about the game, about the players, about the greats like Babe Ruth he saw play years before. Our grandfather fell in love with baseball when he immigrated from Sicily to Pennsylvania coal mines. As a special treat, Grandpa sometimes took us on the subway to a ball game at Connie Mack Stadium in North Philly. We get there early for batting practice, stay for all nine innings. The field so bright, so green, the warm air scented with hot dogs, popcorn, beer, and peanuts. The stands alive with shouts, laughter, booze, and vendors calls. Grandpa always bought us soda, nuts, and souvenirs. 
I still have the little doll he bought me, all wire and cloth in a woolen Billy's uniform, standing on sturdy wooden feet. My grandma Minnie always asked, who won? We knew she only cared that we had fun. Grandma was deathly afraid of severe thunderstorms that often blew through sweltering days. If a storm hit while we were at gran my grandparents' home, grandma unplugged the TV, the radio, the fan, the lights, put the blessed mother statue in the window facing outward. She sat us around the dining room table, gave us each a bottle of seven up as we sat quietly in the hot dark room sipping and praying in Sicilian to Santa Barbara, who was in charge of protecting us through storms. At each sizzling flash of lightning, at each crashing clap of thunder, our grandmother shouted, Jesu! Seven Up tasted extra special with that touch of fear. I remember those summers of baseball and storms when my grandparents used Seven Up to help us learn to help us cope. And this next one is a story my father used to tell a lot about his grandfather. And it's called Waiting for the Gumpare. I'm using the Sicilian Gumpare, but it's from the Italian word Gumpare, which means a male friend. Waiting for the Gumpare. One day when my father, named for his grandfather Sadu, was a small boy digging, weeding, coaxing crops with his grandfather in a hot Sicilian field. He asked, no, no, when can we eat? When the gupati comes, was the answer. As the sun passed the highest point in the sky, Sarutsu asked again, no, no, when can we eat? When the gupati comes. Sarutsu looked up and down the mountain path searching for the gupati who must be coming from far away, walking slowly, maybe holding on to a big bastone. No one knew, when is the gupati coming? Soon. Sarutsu scanned the closest road, bent down to his work, said, no one knew, I'm hungry. Maybe the gupati's not coming. Sarutsu, the gupati has arrived. Where, when, I don't see him. The gupati, is your hunger, he is here. They laughed together as they sat to eat their bread, cheese, and olives. And this next one is called a betrayal. During the Great Depression, when Mussolini was il duce of Italy, my grandmother Maria Goncetta was trying to make ends meet in Sicily with three children, her husband far away, out of work in America. Her elderly father, Sadu Adamo, lived with her, helping her with the farming and the children. When Sadu was a young man, before all his babies died, except for Maria Goncetta, before his pretty wife, Maria Formica, died so young, he had put money aside, little by little, for a time of need. He stashed the bills in the trunk where he kept the velvet suit he wanted to be buried in. Sadu saw how his only child struggled and suffered. Surely this was a time of need. He gave the cash to his daughter. The money was a lot, yet looked different. Big paper certificates. Maria Concetta took her father's money to the bank where the teller scoffed. Said the money was no good. Should have been exchanged years before. I'll take it off your hands, he said. No, Maria Goncetta said, give me back the bills. I'll let my children play with them. When Maria Goncetta told her father, Saru felt betrayed, bitter, sad. All his back-breaking work, all his sacrifices to save, all his hard-earned money now worth nothing, a betrayal. Saru was illiterate. He could not have read, posted notices when to exchange his savings for new money. A betrayal of a contadino who worked all his life to help his family. Mario Concetta comforted her father. Together they cursed the government and life's hardness. While nearby, 
the children were having such great fun playing with their grandfather's old time money. And this next one is, is back in America and back to my maternal side. And this is called Ufamasuni, which means the big famous guy. My nonna Matia, when she came to Philadelphia in the first half of the 20th century, did not know William Penn, whose statue stands atop City Hall, founded Philadelphia in 1908. She called him Ufamasuni, Sicilian for the big famous guy. She learned to orient herself by looking up to see where Ufamasuni was facing. She told her daughters to let Ufamasuni be their guide if they got lost in the city. When I was a little girl, I was taught to do the same, though I knew the big famous guy was William Penn. When I was an adult, I found out that fathers taught their sons that Ufamasuni, the big famous guy, William Penn, was pissing down on the city he founded from his perch atop City Hall. From Ufamasuni, I learned directions. My brothers learn political reality. And finally, I have two poems that I will read to you. They're from my new book, The Good. Well, not really that new. It's a couple years old, The Good for the Good. And these are a collection of sayings in Sicilian and, and Italian that I heard growing up. And each of them is a nugget of wisdom that has been passed down through the years. So I'll read you this one. Tip the hat you got. Saludo cuca pedu My grandfather, Pietro Guayetti, used to say. I called him grandpa. My loving, patient grandfather always answered all my questions. Grandpa, I asked, what does saludo cuca pedu mean? He said, saludo cuca pedu Tip the hat you got. Grandpa, what does that mean? He said, if you got on a little cap, you tip your little cat. If you got on a great big Texas 10 gallon hat, you tip your great big Texas 10 gallon hat. If you got on a top hat, straw hat or derby, you tip your top hat, straw hat or derby. Grandpa, what does that mean? He said, saludo cuca peduki ay. Tip the hat you got. If you are poor, if you are rich, it does not matter. Respect yourself, respect others. Do your best with what you got. Saludo cuca pedu ki Tip the hat you got. And finally, I'd like to read you from my last poem, Patate, which means potatoes. Americans say bologna. My Sicilian family says patate. Potatoes, so humble, so commonplace. Badati. To politicians' promises, badati. To flatterers' compliments, badati. To advertisers' claims, badati. We are schooled in humility by badati. We cannot ever be too proud with badati. Someone says he is a CEO. CEO of what? Badati. You say you want a prize? A prize for what? Badadi, honorifics, the dean of Badadi, the queen of Badadi, the cavaliere of Badadi, the contessa of Badadi, the doctor of Badadi, the bishop of Badadi. Potatoes, so humble, so commonplace, Badadi. The world is full of Badadi. And thank you for your attention. Beautiful, and thank you, Maria, for uh, for all of your poems. Sorry that, that, that I missed your book. I'm sorry that I missed your other book. Like, you know, forget forget the fact that we didn't even, okay. that we didn't have okay. it. It was just the latest. Cool, cool, cool. Just the latest. Well, so when, when was it uh, When was it uh, put out, actually? You said it was only like, a couple of years. The, the, yeah, it, the, the end of 2019. End of 2019, gotcha, gotcha. Well, you can find uh, more about uh, Maria in her website. Uh, the link has just been dropped over in chat. Uh, thank you both for your poems. And uh, as we said, if you have any, any questions or comments 
uh, for the poets, feel free to drop those into chat and we can ferret those right along. Um, first question that I have is for both of y'all. It's really just like a reflection of, of, uh, of the readings that you had now. So many things that are about uh, family and, uh, and just the people in your lives and history. Um, it can always be an interesting proposition putting real people into poems that you're going to read out loud and that you're going to publish. How has it been kind of like navigating with your family um, and with the people you love in your life, uh, adding them into the poems? Whoever wants to take it. Um, <laughs> I have some estrangement in my family and I, I write about that a bit. Um, so I have to say that you know, family, friends of family, you know, read my poems and they say, oh, yeah, you know, you're capturing that, whatever. But, um, you know, my, my mother passed away, I guess, I think it'll be 13 years. So, um, you know, I was there kind of part-time caregiver. And uh, she does come in, you know, the whole situation comes into some poems. She, she lived four years after a devastating stroke. But um, I think I, I think I shared some of my poems with her from my first book. Um, I would they were poignant, but um, I, th I think people understand some things I went through and happy times too. Mm. But I don't really get feedback from close family members. Understood. Understood. So what what about for you personally? Um, how has it been to be able to really dive into those stories? It's probably cathartic. Um, I'm, pro I'm, I'm gentle when I relay some of the situations I went through after my mother's uh, illness. It was, a it was a traumatic four years I went through, maybe six years, and time after mm -hmm. time after. They don't really pop up into my writing so much anymore, maybe my earlier books. But um, no, for me, I, you know, I, I can handle it. I touch on family in this book. I mean, I, I have good memories. You know, we were in a, an Italian American family. I have two younger sisters. I, I traveled with them. We were close friends. But you know, as many people know, illness and death can create um, earthquakes mm -hmm. in family. So, I think I survived. I'm still standing. So I'm grateful for that. <laughs> thing, and thank you so much for for sharing that with us. Um, same question for you, Maria. Uh, well, I find that my family has been very, very supportive of my work. And so I don't have any, um, I've never experienced any problems. And they've never told me to my face that they hated anything. So uh, it's okay, I think. And as I said, I'm the big sister, so I write what I want. <laughs> Absolutely. It's nice to be able to, to be at a point you can feel your weight around, um, like even if it's, if it's on the page a little bit. <laughs> yeah, Juan. Cool, cool, cool. Um, as I said, for both the both of the works that I have read of yours, uh, really connected to the natural world. And uh, and particularly for you, Amy, you know, like defying extinction. Um, you you really, it, it, was, it was really interesting to have a book that was so much about nature, but that also was a book of pandemic poems. And about living right now, uh, yeah. How was it like, kind of like that balance there? Um, well, before the pandemic hit, I'd written a number of these poems because I wanted to take a different. Um, I write a lot of poems of memory, place, and uh, my book "We Became Summer." Several reviewers called it an autobiography in verse, so I wanted to get away with that. And I happened to come upon many interesting articles. Um, about creatures that were almost extinct, but they survived, and now they're not so much thriving, but they're gonna they're gonna be, they're gonna live. And so I thought, oh, you know, I, I kept clipping these different articles, and I would do research. So my book started, you know, evolving more into the theme I really wanted to embrace. But then, of course, I always throw in personal stories. But that was it. And then with the pandemic, I write a few poems. Um, I, I wrote more the first year of the pandemic, the second year, not so much, but um, that's, then I folded them in. 
Yeah, going back to all of those animals, it was really cool. Um, just, you know, these animal names that I've never heard before. And it could have right. been just like a made up for all I, for all I knew. <laughs> But at the same time, they were tethered to places that were like in the U.S. or that, you know, that I've been to, like up in the Rockaways or, right. or, or, or where you might be. Um, yeah, it was, it was a really interesting way of kind of like making, um, you know, making the everyday life like feel magical. That was something that I really <laughs> felt like it took away a lot. Thank you. Yeah, it was interesting for me to come upon these articles and um and, and see that, yeah, right. In the Rockaways, the plover, um, he's still, he's thriving. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. And yeah, Maria, for you, um, like you, you had uh, your your book before last was just a chronicle of different animals inside of your life. And you went through a, a lot of pets uh, that I had there. What, what made you decide to make that focus? Well, I've always loved animals. Uh, not only domestic, but wild animals. And I thought uh, I wanted to write a book that showed how people often exploit animals, not only love them, but also exploit them. So that's why the book covers a number of animals and people's relationship with animals. Oh, for sure. Do you have a, a particular uh, like animal uh, in your life that really stands out from, from the ones that you covered? Other than the ones that are in the book, I've had pets since that came out. And the pets, my cats and dogs and whatever. But right now I have a cat, Dante. But uh, they often appear in my poems. Got you. Is Dante made into a, into a poem yet? Not yet. But he may appear. My last <laughs> cat, the past in May, there's a lot of poems about Dolly. And in the book, there's poems about elephants and insects, and birds, and whales, dolphins, elephants. Yeah, no, the span is the span is really cool. Um, this is a question that I actually asked Silver in, in the last, uh, last month's reading as well. Uh, we had our poet laureate, uh, Ara, um, on, on, as well as uh, Philip B. Williams. And uh, we talked a little bit about kind of like what 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 brings them to a poem when they when they first get started. And for both of them, a lot of it came out of sound and in their roots in music. Um, and so you know we talked about memory, um, so that definitely can be included. But but when you first get that inspiration, and you know Maria, you brought your new poems. Like like what's the hook? What is it that that's the start of the inspiration? It could be a sound. It could be you know, just always eavesdrop. I find myself always eavesdropping. And I listen and sometimes a sound or something somebody says to me and then I'll write it down and then I'll work on it. But it could be music. It could be a memory that just all of a sudden pops into your head. And uh, or this anything could, could kind of... Um, with my last book though, I consciously took phrase these sayings that I had heard and then I use them as jumping off points but usually it's something that that strikes me you know from memory or from a sound Maybe. how about you Amy? you know I finally um went back to traveling in June after I hadn't been on a plane since 2016 and I wanted to see more of the country because I lived in Italy for five years and then I moved to New York and you don't get as much vacation time as you do in Italy. So I went out to Wyoming and South Dakota and I have my little uh, uh, notebook with me and I took a lot of notes. So I've written a few poems based on, you know, the wilds of Wyoming and some history I learned, which was interesting, like Heart Mountain, which was a Japanese internment camp. Um, we heard one of the survivors who had been a young boy speak by Zoom and that inspired a poem. So I, th I think now new places are an inspiration, but um, you know, I wrote a memory poem a few weeks ago and I know some of my Brevitas poet friends are on with us. Brevitas is an online poetry group where we share 
uh, two short poems a month. And you can, or, you know, offer feedback. And that's a help to me to get uh, comments and how's this, how's this coming along. So um, thank you to my Revitas friends out there. They're very supportive. Uh, a lot of them are based in New York, but um, I read a memory poem, which was odd, but it's just a memory that was with me from childhood and uh, and feel, you know, if something's going on in my life, I have a certain kind of feeling, I'll weave it into a poem in some way. I will, grief, um, you know, a bad mood. Uh, it, it, it'll be in my poem. Got you. Yeah. And I mean, it's like, it, it's easy to forget the importance of community and, uh, and just like keeping you in and keeping you inspired. It's, it's, right. it's not always just like yeah, having your hooks. It's, it's also just being around people. Right. Well, to share a poem, you know, I, um, I tend to write a lot in the spring and every day in April, which is poetry month. It's some exercise I started years ago. Um, I'm kind of petering out, but I'm, hoping to be, uh, to revitalize it this year. And then I go back. So I always have poems to submit to Bravitas and uh, see where it goes. But it helps to get that feedback. I don't usually take workshops. No, no, for sure. Yeah, so we're just about uh, at the end of our time. Unfortunately, enjoyed so much speaking with, uh, with both of you. Um, I guess last thoughts, um, like one inspiring uh, poem, book of poems, uh, piece of music uh, that, that, that you might want to share with us that, that we can take home with us. Uh, let's start with you, Amy. What, you, you want me to name something? Yeah. Or read something? Um, oh, uh, you can read something if you like. If it's a short poem. Please. Um... Well, I only have my new book in front of me. Um, here's, here's a poem that a lot of people like the last line. I hear they're quoting it when they're out at cocktail parties. <laughs> so I'll read um, Getting In Tune. I'm actually, I'm a big music buff. I've been going out to hear live music since I was like 13. Getting In Tune. Surviving takes practice. It took decades to know you were better off without them, though Italians are supposed to love family. Tunes tingle memories.